Number 10, monkey head transplant. Okay, right off the top, here we go, pun intended. The first ever successful monkey head transplant was back in the early 1970s. I imagine some of your parents may have heard about this. It's probably pretty hard to forget. Maybe ask them about it tonight while they're mid-bite at dinner. American researcher Robert White pulled off the otherwise impossible in a slow, tedious operation. White took the head of one monkey and then attached it to a headless monkey. Yeah, add a little time and energy and voila, this actually worked. Yeah, believe it or not, the monkey actually tried to bite one of the surgeons once it came to, which, I mean, totally fair. I'd be a little pissed off too if I just had a different body all of a sudden. Sadly, the monkey passed away nine days later, which is much further than I ever thought. But the fact that this actually happened is one, terrifying, and two, dare I say, miraculous. This is some sci-fi stuff right here. And here you go, new head, enjoy. Number nine, monkey become human. Okay, this next test here is a little less hands-on. So if you have some food, you could probably take a bite during this one. It's safe. Back in 1931, psychologist Winthrop Kellogg, familiar name, he was curious. Yeah, he sat up one night out of the blue and thought, hmm, what would happen if a monkey was raised with humans? Yeah, would it end up like that monkey from MVP, most valuable primate, would it learn to play hockey for the local team? Or would it learn how to do kickflips with Tony Hawk? No, none of that shit happened. Surprise, surprise. Kellogg brought a baby female chimp named Gua into his home, and this man raised a chimp as if it were another human being alongside his own son, human son, Donald. Yeah, they played, they laughed, they did everything together. But the test ended abruptly after Kellogg's son, Donald, started to make chimp noises. Yeah, and then everyone was like, you know what? I'm good, let's cancel this. Maybe chimps can't learn how to heel flip. We're done, let's go home. So Gua was then Released. There we go. No more human best friend, you know? Back to normal, dare I say, normal? Number eight, feel the music. Okay, this next one here is a little fun and we're on a part three and I have to talk about it. I just have to talk about it. There are many odd experiments in history where humans should have left, you know, human elements out, like music and illicit substances. I can't say what I want to say, but it's white. It's fluffy. It's a bad substance that's white and fluffy. There you go. That's all I'll say. YouTube's like, oh, what is he saying? I can't figure it out. There you go. Only, only you and I know. We're too smart for the algorithm. Well, back in 2011, a study was done where rats, just a bunch of rats, were all put in a room and on loop, they played a Miles Davis song. So they're all on said illicit substance, right? That stuff. And they were in a room while Miles Davis played all, all day long. Just smooth jazz all day. I'm not laughing because like it's funny. I'm just, it's the weirdest thing. Imagine walking into this room by accident you're like, what's going on in here? Oh my God, everyone's all hopped up. Well, before the substances were injected into the test subjects, they all seemed to have calm demeanors while Beethoven played on loop. But after injected, all the rats were neurologically triggered to that smooth, smooth jazz. Yeah, after one week on the sauce, the rats were all of a sudden like, you know what, Miles Davis, kind of slaps. Been sleeping on Miles Davis this whole time. They're all like, yeah, Miles Davis, really good, so good. Horrible animal research and taxpayers' money yeah, we love dark history here on Most Amazing Top 10. Number seven, the first pregnancy test. If you're looking past the ancient Egyptian times and their use of barley and urine to determine if somebody is pregnant, you'll often land on this experiment from the 1930s. Now, it was developed in 1931 by Dr. Maurice Friedman at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, what would happen is doctors would inject they would inject a rabbit with urine from a woman who was suspected of being pregnant. And the rabbit's ovaries could easily tell if that was the case. Accurate test? Yeah. Historical? Of course, it changed the game. Would it also end up with the rabbits passing away? Sadly, also a third yes. It's sad, but more often than not, when humans are involved with any medical process, the test subject dies. You know, before having its head transferred to another animal or something, you're like, what the f is happening here? Number six, small brain and big brain. This next one here, I mean, again, we're on a part three. We're getting into some f***ed up stuff. Here we go. In the early 19th century, humans were figuring out a lot of uh, firsts, you know, especially German researcher Carl August Weinhold. He was on the quest to prove to all that the brain and its nervous system were both attached by wires. Yeah, in order to do so, he took brains and spinal cords of deceased cats and he filled the cavities inside with zinc and silver batteries. And like we know now, the obvious happened. The bodies began to reanimate as if they were alive again. 
Huh, it's like it's black magic. Or batteries, probably batteries. It's definitely the batteries. This was the first time this type of test was done and now we use electricity and silver for other ways, of course. But thanks to this curious doctor, the early 19th century saw some early Bill Nye the gross science guy stuff. Again, w imagine walking into this room by accident. Like, ho oh, oh, what's going on in here now? Number five, the multi-dog. Ah, nice, I love dogs. Let's get a bunch for the price of none. Back in the 50s when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created a multi-dog, Time Magazine had to cover it. Of course, this is a feat in science. As cruel as it sounds, of course, the adult dog had a newborn grafted to its neck. It's impressive, but also you're like, ew, my God, Jesus. So when it grew, it could survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term, gross. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics, which was the craziest point here. Some say it was playful with its growls, just as the other dog's characteristics would be. It's a sad 1950s Soviet animal experiment, so of course the animal didn't survive for a long time. It just, you know, all of a sudden it was on something's neck and then it was in the next life. That's horrible. Number four, the Great Razor Auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coast, the Great Auk would grow to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were little cute tiny boys. They were cute, but quite defenseless, obviously, since they're not here anymore. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting. And it just happened to be where most of these great auks were all living. Yeah, Newfoundland, go get screeched in and then take out a thousand ox. There we go. It was packed, so they rapidly declined. And by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island. What a But now, scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs, you know, people how they have, you know, birds and jars and stuff like that. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor build auk. So yeah, the organization Revive and Restore may bring these birds back to life, so. Cute Flappy Wings may just return. Remember that game Flappy Wings? Disappeared from the app store so quick. Disappeared faster than number three, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled islands all over the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were gray and blue. They didn't have any natural predator until, you know, we came along. Sorry, we got hungry. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. That's where it comes from. They weren't just loved by sailors either. No, monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. And reminder, they were big eggs. So it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681. Again, imagine being that guy, what a dick. But could it be? Could we bring the dodo back to life with science? Yes, apparently, this could be a real thing. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes and we're gonna see them in the sky. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back, you know, animals and stuff. Scientifically, that's a wonderful feat, but do we really think no one's gonna make dodo bird chicken wings? I'm gonna get that on Uber Eats in a year. I can just smell it. Number two, the gastric brooding frog. Crossbreeding and gastric brooding. Nice, we're getting close to the end, it seems. I'm a big fan of frogs and the gastric brooding frog is particularly interesting to me and also scientists due to their birthing process. If you're eating something, now would be a good time to you know, hit that thumbs up, maybe take a break, put that food to the side for a bit. See, these frogs back, you know, and when they were alive, they would swallow their eggs and then they would hatch them later out of their mouths. Pretty, pretty horrible if you watch that in time lapse, I bet. They're fascinating creatures. And with the Lazarus Project, scientists are actually trying to bring back the Australian gastric brooding frog from extinction. So we might see this horrible act in person. You might go to catch a frog and then all of a sudden I'd be like, Wah! and there's a baby will come out of it and you'll be like, all right, I'm all set actually, how about that? They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists scientists have figured out how to implant dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Amphibians are declining worldwide, so if we can get these guys back out of extinction, it'd be one point for Gryffindor. We'd be looking a lot better, that's all I'm saying. And finally, number one, Martha. Look, I like to keep it light, so I have to end with my girl Martha. The passenger pigeon once flocked over the skies of Canada. This was the 19th century, and it looked a lot different. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large that it would block the sun out for a short short amount of time. Wow. Hashtag flocks that block. We love it. But only a few decades passed and the passenger pigeon, just, just, they're, they're gone, just like that. They're no more. So what exactly happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She sadly passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her past and their extinction. And we found a couple. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting eliminated the nicest looking pigeon, arguably. The last one died in 1914, but 
in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon in protected indigenous lands in the Northwest Territories. So now they've blended passenger pigeon DNA with dinosaur DNA, so that's always exciting. We've seen a few movies on how that can go wrong. We're bringing back pigeons with a touch of dinosaur. I'll say it again, on one hand, I'm glad science is allowing us to, you know, try again, have another go, but look at the pigeons we have now. Those pigeons are hardcore. These things will walk onto the subway with you. Pigeons today will ask you for change. They're ruthless, they're covered in mustard. It's not the same. These graceful birds from the 1910s, I feel like we're bringing back Captain America, you know what I mean? I don't think these old school chaps will appreciate the new game of pigeons. They're a little dirty, I don't know. I don't think they're ready, and I don't think we are either. In our ninth spot today, we have the human mouse. Mice are constantly being experimented on in labs. This time, scientists in Japan tried to create a human mouse. Basically, they injected a mouse with human stem cells. They did this in an attempt to grow a human pancreas in the animal, but due to backlash, they have certain rules in place. At any point during the experiment, if the mouse is said to start developing a human-type brain, then it has to be killed and the experiments have to stop. Thank gosh though, because uh, I'm not trying to have the world ruled by weird mutant human mice, no thank you. In our 8th spot today, we have the mice with human brain. So I know I just finished saying how the mice were killed if any human DNA was found in the brain, but in 2005, a professor at Stanford University was given permission to create a mouse-human hybrid. He did so by transplanting human brain stem cells into the brains of mice. Now, the main goal of his experiment was to be able to study neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Now, the first couple of rounds did not go so well. They found less than 1% of human cells in the rodent's brain. But by 2010, they found success. That's when they managed to, and I quote, use mouse stem cells to develop sensory hair cells which could combat human hearing loss. They also managed to make the mice more human. As in, the mice with the human brain cells were far more intelligent than the other mice. In our seventh spot, we have the human Z. Over the years, a number of scientists have run some wild tests on chimpanzees. Now, what makes these mammals of interest to them is because of how similar they are to humans. Humans and chimps share 98.8% of their DNA, hence why scientists are trying to make a chimp-human hybrid. Ilya Ivanov was the first person to attempt to create a human-chimp hybrid. Ilya continued these experiments until the 1920s. During that time, the Soviet Union was also running the same experiments. In 2019, rumor has it that a team of researchers from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in the US successfully produced the first human monkey chimeras. So yeah, I don't really know how I feel about that. I don't know. In our six spots, we have the Kunga. In the early 2000s, when scientists unearthed the Kunga skeletons in northern Syria, they had no idea what they were looking at. The skeletons looked like they belonged to horses, but they dated back to 2600 BC. And domestic horses wouldn't appear in the region for another 500 years, so they were a bit confused. Then they realized that this wasn't a horse, it was a human bred animal. In fact, this animal was a cross between a donkey and a wild ass. Apparently back then they were highly valuable and very expensive. Now it's believed that these kungas were created for warfare, because not only could they pull wagons, but it was believed that they would be tougher. The thing with donkeys is that they would get scared easily and they didn't need their donkeys running off mid battle but the wild asses, no one could tame them. So then they would breed them together and bam, it created an animal more desirable for them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the human pig hybrid. The whole crossing humans with animal thing definitely creeps me out, but this one isn't what you think. They aren't creating a creature that is half human and half pig. Thank gosh, at least not yet. Instead, they are using the pigs to grow human organs inside of them instead of having patients wait for a donor. The first experiment was run in 2017, and an embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. Then it was taken out to analyze, and the embryo survived and contained some human cells. Now they are going to figure out if pig embryos can handle enough human cells to create full human organs. However, a lot of people are against these experiments, saying that it is highly unethical. In our fourth spot, we have the dogs. 
A number of the dog breeds that you love have been severely crossbred. And when dog breeders get overcome by greed, they start to care more about money than they do about their dog's health. Take a look at this dog right here. This is a dog that suffers from short spine syndrome. You can see it has a squished body, huge jaw, and a really bad underbite. The dog was born from backyard breeding. The breeder was carelessly breeding a bunch of his dogs together. And this is the result, which is heartbreaking to see. And most of the time, these dogs are put down as no one wants to adopt them. Coming in at number three, we have the virus Chimera. In 2017, Portuguese researchers decided to mess around with a mouse virus to create a chimera virus. Basically, a mouse virus with a human viral gene. Now, you're probably concerned like me, because I read this and I'm like, oh, they're trying to create another outbreak or something. But no, apparently this allows them to study viruses and how it impacts the rodent's body. But I will say that accidental outbreaks have occurred. In our second spot, we have the rabbit human mix. In 2003, a team of scientists in Shanghai managed to fuse human cells with rabbit eggs. In the United States, scientists have been trying to do the same thing, but their attempts were always unsuccessful. Move over, American scientists, the one in Shanghai, be you to it. Now, this experiment was done to see if it can be used to grow cells or tissues for transplant patients. However, this experiment also had strict rules, and once the rabbit had human cells in its brain, it had to be destroyed. So they only let the human rabbit develop for a couple of days before they killed it and harvested it for stem cells. And in our number one spot today, we have the human demon sheep. Now, this is going to keep you up at night for sure. In 2017, villagers in South Africa were horrified when a sheep gave birth to something that didn't look like a lamb, okay? In fact, it looked eerily human-like. As a result, people in the village were freaking out, saying that whatever was born was done by the works of the devil. In fact, rumor has it that this lamb was created from someone injecting the sheep with human sperm. Now, the lamb was still born, so it wasn't born alive. But still, how creepy is that? And many people in the village were convinced that beast and or witchcraft were behind this creature. Starting off this countdown, we have the wall fin. Take a guess at what two animals were bred for this one. If you guessed a whale and a dolphin, you're correct. A wall fin is a mix between an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin and a false killer whale. The first recorded wolfin was born in 1981 in Tokyo SeaWorld. But sadly, he only lived to around six months. Probably a prime example of why they shouldn't exist in the first place. Another wolfin was later born at a sea life park in Hawaii in 1985. But she had trouble reproducing and all her babies sadly passed away. In our ninth spot today, we have the horse human. And this one is going to ruin your day completely. In 2001, a man was caught trying to inject human sperm into a horse. He had done this to about six horses until he was caught by police and arrested. Thankfully, none of the horses got pregnant. But ew, imagine if they did, woo. In our eighth spot, we have the Iron Age Pig. Now take a look at this porker, he is a chunky guy. The Iron Age Pig is a cross between a domestic pig and a wild boar. Now something about that cross just does not sit right with me. Now people like breeding these pigs because they can get a lot of meat out of them or just sell them for a lot. But they are considered very hostile animals. This is due to the fact that wild boars are typically more aggressive. And that's a dominant trait that gets passed along to their offspring. Moving on to number seven, we have the the infertile pink bullworm. The pink bullworms are invasive pests that lay eggs on cotton balls. And then once they hatch, the larvae eat the seeds and damage the cotton fibers. In 2005, the situation became so bad that scientists were like, okay, we gotta figure out a solution here. So they decided to create sterile pink bullworms. They did this by treating a bunch of moths with radiation. The radiation would damage their reproductive cells, but it wouldn't kill them. That way, when they encountered a normal pink bullworm and the two mated, bam, it would create an infertile pink bullworm. So for four years, two billion pink bullworm moths that were treated with radiation were released into Arizona's cotton fields. They literally would fly an airplane above the fields and just drop millions of these moths down onto the crops. And it worked. It helped with the bullworm problem. But imagine if their plan didn't work 
that could have gone really bad and damaged entire cotton fields. Coming in at number six, we have the sheep with human livers. In 2007, scientists at the University of Nevada, Reno, managed to grow human livers inside of a sheep. They did this by injecting human stem cells from bone marrow into sheep fetuses. Now, they chose sheep as their test subjects because their circulatory system is very similar to ours. In the end, they managed to create livers made with 20% human cells. They are hopeful that one day this can be used to help grow human organs for those in need of a transplant inside these animals. But anything done with animals is highly controversial, especially when it has to do with injecting them with human DNA and stuff. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the cows. I swear, no animal is safe out there, okay? Not even cows. In 2008, British researchers were given the okay to conduct some human animal experiments. As part of the experiment, they decided to manipulate cow eggs. So they took the nucleus of the cow egg, which has the source of the most DNA, and they replaced it with the nucleus of a human cell to create a growing embryo. They then watched the egg develop and multiply. Scientists could then extract the stem cells from this. They hope that one day they can use the stem cells in disease treatments. Moving on to number four, we have the Jeep. And I'm not talking about the car Jeep, we're talking G-E-E-P, okay? A mixture between a goat and a sheep. Now these animals are adorably cute, but sadly breeding the two can be a very risky game. Very few babies are actually carried to term, and even few manage to survive birth. Those that do often have a bunch of genetic abnormalities, but people still cross them together, which is just sad because you're breeding animals destined for failure, and for what reason? Moving on at number three, we have the Jaglion. Can you guys guess what this animal is a mix between? It's kind of obvious. It's a mix between a jaguar and a lion. But these animals are actually naturally born, which is wild. Like, I just can't imagine a jaguar and a lion getting it on. So it first started when a lion and a jaguar coexisted in the same zoo together. They were raised together and well, one thing led to another, bada bing bada boom, mama lion became prego. I shared this love story in another video, but it's so cute but also sad, but I just wanna share it again. So there once was a jaguar named Diablo and a lion named Lola. The two were raised side by side and they were inseparable. When Lola got mature though, they kept Diablo away from her so that they wouldn't mate. But whenever they were apart, both animals got depressed. It got so bad to the point where Lola wouldn't even eat. So they brought them back together and they were happy and eating and thriving again. You can't keep true love apart. And obviously one thing did lead to another and they did end up mating and they had two Jaglian babies together and they all lived happily ever after. Coming in at number two, we have the goat human. I can't with this one. Okay, I just can't. But this image right here is said to be a picture of a human goat baby. Story goes that in 2016 in Alabama, of all places, a goat gave birth to an odd looking baby. In fact, its kid looked very human-like. So it's said that this goat was actually the product of a human getting it on with the goat. I know, I know, it's disgusting, it's disgusting. I threw up in my mouth a little when I read that, but again, this is just a rumor. And and in our number one spot today, we have the hybrid lions. Now, this is actually a very sad example of crossbreeding gone wrong. In 2006, nearly two dozen crossbred lions in northern India were dying after they developed a mysterious disease. The disease was a result of inbreeding and a weakened gene pool. Basically, they didn't know this, but they kept breeding lions that all had this weakened gene, and nearly 80 lions were affected by this. The lions being born had weak hind legs and had difficulty walking, and they couldn't run at all. They also had failing immune systems and they weren't living too long. But the worst part was that they let these animals suffer. There's a wildlife law in India which prohibits the killing of animals. So basically, they had to just wait for these lions to die a slow, painful death on their own. It's a very tragic case of breeding gone wrong. In our number 10 spot, we have Vladimir Demikov. Vladimir is a scientist from the Soviet Union that tried to create a two-headed dog. Not making this up. Not in the regular crossbreeding way that you may assume. He literally amputated the body of one of the dogs and attached it to the other. 
this honestly makes me sick to talk about. The dogs only lasted four days before passing away, and guess what? He did it again. He did it again. The next experiment ended up with two dogs living for about a month. But guess what? He literally had no purpose for these experiments. Just the ego satisfaction of being able to say that he did it. Well, thankfully he didn't because he doesn't deserve any satisfaction or praise. Just gross. In our number nine spot, we have Paracelsus. Paracelsus is known for being a Swiss physician, scientist, and alchemist in the 1500s during the Renaissance. He didn't necessarily experiment with crossbreeding humans with animals, but he did experiment with making humans tiny and ginormous. Also, he was seemingly evil slash insane, so I just wanted to put him on this list. Paracelsus was convinced he could grow giants and tiny humans by growing them from a jar of Yep. Apparently he would keep the jar in a warm place and feed the creatures blood to make them grow. I can just see him sprinkling in some blood into that jar. <laughs> Apparently he was quite successful and managed to grow tiny humans, but allegedly the small creatures turned on him and ran away. <laughs> Naturally. They were said to be a foot high. In our number eight spot, we have Irving Wiseman. Irving Wiseman was working at Stanford University as a researcher when he was given permission to inject a mouse with human brain cells. They just wanted to see what would happen. They were instructed to stop the experiment once the human-like behaviors got to a specific point like improved memory or problem solving, because then they'll have a pinky in the brain sitch and the concept of that only sounds good in the cartoon world. I'm not ready for a mouse world takeover anytime soon. In our number seven spot, we have Gordon Gallup and his team of scientists. Okay, so not saying Gordon Gallup is the evil scientist, but more that all of the scientists that consented to do this in the first place may have been operating from an evil frequency. Or perhaps they were just doing what they were told because it's their job. Because let's be real, the real powerful people that make the decisions are the ones funding such projects as these. But since I have no idea who funded this, as that would probably take too much digging that I don't have time for and it will probably just lead us to the US government, <laughs> we're going to just call this spot Gordon Gallup and his team of scientists. Gordon Gallup was once one of the leading experts in evolutionary psychology and he worked with a team of scientists in the 1920s on interbreeding humans with chimpanzees. He leaked to the press that they were actually successful. The experiment was conducted at the Orange Park Laboratory in Florida. Everyone proceeds to Google the financial backers there. This is where a female chimpanzee was inseminated with human the animal not only became pregnant, but then proceeded to give birth to a living being, a human Z. But get this, they did not allow the human Z to live. After all of that, it was euthanized. What the heck, man? Potentially harmed this animal by impregnating it only to kill its baby cub. <sighs> My inner future mama bear is poking through and I don't like this. In our number six spot, we have another group of scientists, the Belgian scientists. It really is so hard to name just one scientist responsible because it really does take a village to raise a child, and in this case, to create a mutant cow. Yes, a team of Belgian scientists started back in the 1800s to breed native cattle with shorthorn cattle, and over time, they only selected the biggest and strongest, and eventually, that led them to creating the Belgian super cow. A ginormous cow that literally looks like it's on steroids, and I'm kinda afraid of it. I'm, I'm very afraid of it. It is unclear why these experiments were being done. I can only assume for more meat. So I guess we can't call these scientists evil per se without a justified reason, but hopefully they have a good one because otherwise, leave those cows alone. In our number five spot, we have Juan Carlos Belmonte. Juan is a biologist at the Salk Institute in California that has been working with other scientists and researchers in China on creating a human-animal chimera. Basically, a monkey embryo will be given human cells to create this. 
Now, before you get upset and say, what for? I think this may arguably be the best reason for doing this kind of experiment. The reason this is being done is to see if animals can possess organs such as livers and kidneys that are entirely human and can be used in the future as organs for transplants. As we do have a transplant shortage around the world, coming up with a solution to this is vital. Apparently every 10 minutes a new person is added to the waiting list for an organ transplant. So at this point it is unclear as to whether the experiment has been completely successful, but I'm sure we'll know in the upcoming years. In our number four spot we have Dr. Carl Klauberg. This guy is truly very evil. He was a doctor that would work in the infamous monstrous camps that I cannot name due to YouTube violation reasons, so please catch my drift. The monstrous camps during World War II, specifically the Poland camp. Apparently, originally, he was interested in sterilizing all of the women of the camp, and eventually, his interests expanded. He was allowed to experiment on thousands, but only 700 survived. He also artificially inseminated prisoners through a variety of methods and tormented his victims by claiming to have injected animal sp into their womb to create a monster. There are no reports that confirm this to be 100% true, as well as there are no reports of the after effects of this, so we have to conclude that this horrible, uh, unconsented experiment was thankfully a failure. Just pure evil. In our number three spot, we have Hiromitsu Nagauchi. Hiromitsu is a scientist from Japan that is leading a team at the University of Tokyo. He and his team plans to grow human cells in mice and rat embryos and then transport them into surrogate animals, similar to work being done at Stanford University in the US. The goal is yet again to continue to see if animals can produce human organs that can later be transplants for humans. Up until recently, Japan was very strict as to how long the human cells in the embryos were allowed to be kept alive till. But recently the laws changed and they're allowed to be kept until the animal is brought to term. Whoa. This will help so much in terms of what they will be able to find through studying this process, but of course there are many ethical concerns around this experiment such as once this new animal is brought to term then won't it be a baby? Some claim that this is pure evil to then destroy this baby after, but gosh, I wonder if the decision maker of these experiments struggle with this, cause I definitely would. In our number two spot, we have an unknown evil scientist that created the human sheep. In 2017, villagers of a small town in South Africa were frightened when a local sheep gave birth to a human sheep crossbreed. This is truly terrifying stuff that will haunt your dreams. Like terrifying. It will definitely haunt mine. Imagine human sheep wandering the world. No thanks. Clearly this experiment was done by some evil scientist that decided, heck, I'm going to just let this happen and see how it unfolds. No one knows exactly how it was done, but most think the sheep was just artificially inseminated. The baby born was a stillborn, but if it had made it out alive, I bet you the world would have been on the hunt for the person responsible. In our number one spot, we have Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov. Known from his title, The Red Frankenstein, who was said to have been the creator of artificial insemination. His interest eventually turned into being interested in crossbreeding. In the 1920s, he traveled to Africa after already successfully crossbreeding a zebra and a donkey, he now wanted to crossbreed a human and an ape. Apparently, after a while of living in Africa, he became desperate as his funds became increasingly low that he then began to inseminate African women with chimpanzees without their knowledge. Holy, that's disgusting. Eventually, when people found out about what he was doing, he was shut down and his name was forever tarnished and yeah, I'm glad because that's horrible. Starting off our list at number 10, new bees. Great, sick of the old ones that sting you in the neck and then you're allergic? We got some new bees now to worry about, here we go. A lot of us know bees are pretty harmless and kind of cute, hairy little pollinators. Unless of course, like I mentioned, you're allergic or terrified of them. But truthfully, bees normally do a lot more good than harm, obviously, right? Save the bees. That was of course until an experiment in the 70s went south. Yeah, this experiment resulted in a new 
bee, just a dangerous bee. The idea was to take a regular honey bee and breed it with a bee that is found in Africa that produces more honey. And of course the goal was to produce a manageable bee that would also be able to provide more honey than a regular honey bee. Good stuff, right? On paper this sounds like a step in the right direction. Well the bees that came out were a lot less manageable and they didn't even make more honey. Yeah, liars. You're fired, all 1,000 of you. Get out of here. After this experiment ended, however, the bees got out into the environment, and in the 80s, we saw the beginning of a massive trouble. These bees are not only aggressive towards other kind of bees, which creates a huge problem, but they're also very aggressive towards human beings. Nice. And when these guys sting, their stinger stays with them, so they can you know, continue to Julius Caesar you how many times they want. The victims of these swarms receive 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms, so. Horrible, horrible news. And they react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile. So, hope you can run really fast and really far. Number nine, Wolfen. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male false killer whale. Yeah, we shouldn't be doing this. They're extremely rare and they have been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity because humans are the worst. The first recorded Wolfen was born in the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, and he very sadly died just 200 days later. Didn't even make it one year, horrible. Probably a prime example of why they maybe shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't know, just a wild observation. The first that was born in the United States that actually somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii in May 1985, and her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. The first passed away after a few days, the second passed away at the age of nine, but thankfully the third one is still alive. In March last year, both Kekamalu and her daughter were still alive, but they remain, of course, in captivity. So it's like, great but not, really not at the same time. Number eight, farm cattle. Back in the 90s, farmers in India were told that if they crossbred their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which in turn would mean more money for them and their families. Awesome, this should be amazing and great news, right? Well, considering why we're here watching, I don't think it's, uh, it's gonna end the way we think, no. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting great results, but they ended up being stuck with cattle that did produce more milk, great, but they also needed way more food. They needed high quality food as well, or else they'd stop producing more milk and they were less resistant to the local diseases, so they required more veterinary visits. So it cost them more money, you know what I mean? Yeah, we got more milk, but we have to spend more money on maintaining the damn thing. That's not a win, it's not a win in my book. Number seven, old Buffalo Jones. Here we go, a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones. Let's talk about him. This man started breeding animals in 1906 because the bison population in Arizona at the time was exceptionally low. So bison were bred with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. Nice, old Buffalo Jones getting his science on. He ended up just giving up on this and released the animals who were then managed by the state. And the numbers remained relatively low because of the limited hunting licenses. Well, when the beefalo, good name, found their way into a national park where hunting is banned and therefore aren't any you know, natural predators, the population began to grow by 50% a year. That's a lot of beefalo. So none of this is necessarily bad, but it's the animal's environmental impact that has the real trouble. First off, they're very thirsty animals and they can consume 10 gallons each per trip to a watering hole. So they're sucking it all up, you know what I mean? It's like when you're in school and you're waiting for water and the guy in front of you just keeps drinking. You're like, oh my God, what are you doing? Where is this going? Not to mention the fact that they do their dirty business in the water and that basically just ruins it all. Basically, they've thrown the entire ecosystem off balance and have pushed out other animals and insects and plant life around have also been infected, all because they're thirsty and they like to take big shits where we all drink our water. Thanks, Beefalo. Number six, hybrid lion. Back in the 1980s, the Chatbir Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller, has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Again, sounds like a great plan at first. How do we make it happen without making weird animals? The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their other two Asiatic lions. Nice. Hey, we'll save ya. Just kidding, even worse. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake as the cubs all had severely weak back legs. They were all shaky. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune system started to fail more and more. Sadly, by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any reproduction further. There's also laws that prohibited them from killing animals, so they were simply just waiting around for them to die naturally. It's kind of a weird circle we got 
responded to. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they just wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred the lions that they had. Know what I mean? It was right there and they're like, all right, now let's try something new. It's like, what, no, why? Number five, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing, here we go, halfway through, time to turn it up a bit. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now this was a time before even horses arrived, so they had to do something, right? Large kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pulling plows. These little guys, they were the talk of the town. Imagine hybrid animals before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yeah, yeah, yummy. I wonder what this one is. Smells a little stinky. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. And it's a wild ass over there. Hey, nice wild ass. It's wild what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from even thousands of years ago. It's mind blowing. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. Number four, super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Just tons of a moo, just a mighty moo. Introducing the super cow. All right, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache and shit your super pants. Only in Belgium, let's do it. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmer brought together native cattle and short horn cattle. After that, they would literally pick the biggest of the bunch and then have them breed together. These cows are officially called Belgian blues but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. I can't even look at these guys. They're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. That makes no sense. They have like eight biceps, the incredible Hulk, just with more milk. Number three, the mouse with an ear on its back. Oh, I want a Q-tip this guy every time I see him. The mouse with a human ear, folks. How did this happen? This is like the world's greatest mouse spy. Stuart Little's evil brother. Let's do it. Back in 1997, this vacanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, aka cells from a cow. And clearly it worked a little too well. It's a little odd what we have. We're still talking about it, obviously. It's weird. It all started when Joseph Vicanti, a pediatric surgeon, began designing human organs. This was during a shortage in time. He wasn't just bored and started to make ears. He was changing the medical game. And little did he know, he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed an ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear to a live mouse. Kind of hard to bring up, but we'll do our best. Okay. Chuck failed. He spilled the beans almost right away. But now we know that cow cartilage can create human cells. That's great. Oh, I want a Q-tip his back. Is that weird? That's not weird. It gives ear cheese a whole new meaning. We're gonna throw out. Number two, the Zorse. I'll give you a second to figure out what animal this is. Nice, there you go. Male zebra, female horse. Now we've got a really fun word. Zebroids are also quite common historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses and donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. It's pretty cute. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey. All these fun names, right? But again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. These zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip and bizarre? Are. Oh, I know. Humans are not great. Humans are too bored, it seems. Starting our list off at number 10, Ilya Ivanov. Beginning in the late 1800s, here we go. Soviet biologists, they actually got permission from the country to breed hybrid ape humans. What did you get up to last summer? <laughs> I'll never tell. She grafted an ovary into a chimp and the goal was to fertilize Nora, the chimp, with human DNA. So they inseminated a group of chimps. None of them got pregnant, so instead they tried to flip the project up. Now this time, they had a human inseminated with the DNA of chimps. Yeah, the other way around. The, the, the volunteer number was low, obviously. Now before anything actually happened, this would have been an absolute train wreck. Before the project was underway, he was sent away to Kazakhstan. So we didn't get any more science projects after that point, thankfully. Yeah, let's just leave uh, monkeys alone. Number nine, human monkey hybrid. Guys, I wish this was fake, but it's not. So scientists, they're currently trying to make human monkey hybrids, like the title just said. They have high hopes that these experiments will succeed because monkeys and humans are similar genetically. So obviously, we're gonna try a few times. Spanish biologist Juan Carlos Esbisula Belmonte is working with monkey researchers in China right now to perform these experiments. So basically they're mixing human cells into monkey embryos and then just, they're just gonna see what happens, I guess. I don't know. Hope it goes well. Their objective is to grow a monkey whose organs are completely made of human cells. Doesn't that sound just terrifying when I say it out loud like that? Then they would use said animals and their organs for people that need them. Yeah, of course this is a little bit controversial in a few ways, so let's just keep moving on. Number eight, Jose Delgado. 
Okay, we're talking about mind control, so I'll give you a moment to put on your tinfoil hats. You might need those for this one. In the early 1900s, Jose Delgado graduated from the University of Madrid. He even lands a professorship at Yale University, but his mind, the whole time, his mind was focused on others. He had other ideas going on. He was committed to mind control, and his go-to method was implants. Yeah, electrode implants, first used with, you guessed it, primates. Yeah, three for three. Weird. He would use a remote control to make them do certain moves, even, you know, moving on to mind controlling a bull. So he was kind of changing the animal game up as he went. He liked to improvise. He got in the ring with said mind controlled bull, but then oddly enough, the bull was calm. It didn't attack. That's weird. Almost like there's an implant in his brain and he doesn't want to do anything. Reports say he stopped the bull last second before it charged. I call bull. I say there's a thing in his head and he wasn't sure what was up the entire time, little poor lad. And then next in the project line came the people. 25 people were tested on with said mind control device. Yeah, by electronically controlling the brain. He believes armies could be controlled down the road and until his death in 2011, he was upset that he wasn't cited as often in terms of mind control project in recent studies. Yeah, weird. Guy who mind controlled animals in the 1900s. We're trying not to do that maybe. I don't know, that's why we're not talking about you. Number seven, see through frogs. Here we go, just when you thought frogs were already hard to spot, boom, now they're invisible. Good luck catching them. Back in 2016, through artificial insemination, scientists successfully took the DNA of two kinds of recessive color frogs, black-eyed frogs and gray-eyed frogs. Then they combined them together to create a frog whose skin is now always translucent. They made, a, they made an X-Men of a frog. We love it. The see-through factor allows observation of organ growth or cancer formation. That's the human science thing. And it kind of helps when you can see the problem, I guess. No dissection needed for further study. Right, just, just looking, just looking through you. That's pretty uh, intrusive. I don't know. Imagine being see-through all the time. Like, hey, pal, my eyes are up here. Quit staring at my pancreas. Number six, tigons. Let tigons be bygones. Let's never do this ever, please. I was gonna say liger, but that's been used before. We all know what that one looks like. Tigons were a real hybrid animal that you could see for yourself at both the London Zoo and the Manchester Zoo at one point in history. This was of course back in the late 30s where folks didn't bat an eye towards these kind of projects or these kind of things. Yeah, step on up and see the tigon. A tiger head and a lion body and a tiger tail all together to make a big old pile of holy yeah, that's what happens when you put animals in the same cage. Sometimes they get along a little too well. Tigon hybrids were seen long before the 90s as well. In 1837, for example, Queen Victoria was gifted a Tigon. That's odd. They're like flowers or a hybrid creature. What do we give the queen? Number five. DIY. Not sure how many times I have to say this in life, but don't try any crossbreeding at home. Or ever, for that matter. Thanks, keep it up. Because things obviously go south. For example, back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy, she was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said she didn't want to keep her. Okay, this happens often. But when Julie saw the dogs, she was in complete disbelief. She was like, yeah, I'll take this living animal. I'm not a monster, I can commit to this for sure, thanks. People who abandon animals also, you're the devil. Don't do that. This dog, it was a hybrid animal. It wasn't healthy, but all the more reasons why you should stick around. The dog had a squished up body, a huge jaw, and a bad underbite, and it was oddly shaped. But you gotta love him still. Look, he's so cute. God, I want him. A little bread dude. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from a backyard breeding place who was carelessly breeding a bunch of these dogs together. Just no effort at all. No care. Thankfully, Julie did bring the dog home and gave her a loving time. Sweet little thing. Olivia and I want a dog so badly. I would definitely take this little hybrid lady in a heartbeat, for sure. A little bread bed for, oh, I love dogs. Even if they're, you know, hybrid and created in a backyard. Number four, glowfish. I never had a fish tank growing up. I don't know, not sure how I felt about a starfish just watching me sleep for hours on end. Back in 2012, Yorktown Technologies created hybrid glow fish. They were first created from zebra fish, but now there's a whole plethora of glow fish that you can purchase. Tiger barbs, rainbow sharks, you name it. Everything's glowy now. I guess to hype up Avatar 2, I don't know. I don't see why we needed hybrid glow fish. Why are we doing this? Can we stop? Bioluminescence is natural. We see octopus or deep sea fish that have it naturally. Scientists in Singapore were originally Originally aiming to modify fish to spot toxins in polluted water in an easier way. Cool. But on one hand, you're like, oh, these fish are pretty beautiful. They're glowy. Can I have one, please? Alan Blake, co-founder of said Yorktown Technologies, wanted them to glow only when near toxins. Now, this was back in 2003 when they first started. Guy wanted real life notifications in the water. Cool. Today, we're at a point where glowfish are just being sold to houses for reasons. 
just because. Do you want a glow fish? I don't know, am I the only one that's like out of the loop with like the glowy fish vibe? Comment down below if a glow fish is something you want or now want. Oops, sorry. Number three, Savannah Cats. This one's been talked about for a while now. How do we feel about Savannah Cats? I wanna hear about this one as well. In May 2012, the International Cat Association registered this Savannah Cat as a new breed. It's official, we got a new cat. Just, just what the world needs, more, more cats. I'm allergic, so, you know, pardon my beef. The international cat community confirms it. Now, it all started in the late 80s when Judy Frank crossbred a male several with a domestic Siamese. The offspring, in turn, was appropriately named Savannah. Yeah, now we have cats with big ass ears, and they're so cute. I can't help but they are so cute. Domestic cats mixed with wild African cats. I mean, it sounds like you're gonna get a cat. I don't know how to tell you. This is like a science experiment that they're like, oh, it worked. And apparently they're great. Apparently they're not too crazy temper-wise, but they're fun and they're energetic. Great for families. Who knew? Better than glowfish. Any day. Any day. Number two, pig human. Scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Scientists, what a mouthful that was, have created a human-pig hybrid. Yeah, in 2017, when worlds collide, let's do it. An embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks, and then when it was taken out and further analyzed, the embryos, not only one, survived, but they also contained some human cells. So their hope now was to grow human organs inside of pigs, instead of, you know, waiting for a donor. Impatient, but okay, we're listening. In 1910, zoologists figured out that it might even be possible to create hybrids between humans and their closest relatives as well. Yeah, no matter how this ends, either Planet of the Apes or Planet of the Pigs, I did my part, okay? I recycled. I didn't f with animal DNA, like Jurassic Park. I just kinda got a job, I don't know. Hands are clean. And finally, number one, Stubbins Firth. We saved Firth for first, let's do it. This is one of the craziest science projects I've ever heard of, so buckle up. Stubbins Firth, a researcher from Pennsylvania back in the late 1700s. First of all, as you could probably guess, methods back in the 1700s were often messy and pretty much illegal in every way. Firth was a doctor in training at the time and he decided to prove to the world that yellow fever was not contagious. Yeah, imagine if you had Twitter. Firth would surgically insert vomit from his patients with yellow fever. He would insert vomit into his body. He would insert all their yuck into his wounds, all over his face, his eyes, you name it. He was trying to get it. He was going the extra, I'm gonna throw up. He was going the extra mile, all in the name of medical research. Even urine and saliva too. Anything yucky, just, he was just, ah, he was rubbing it in. Firth, to all of our surprise, did not get sick. He was proud of that one. He told everybody the news loudly. He mansplained it at like 4 a.m. We look back now though and we realize Firth just sampled late stage patients. So they were further along. Much further, say, than the contagious period. So basically he volunteered to dump all the uh, on his uh. Yeah, science. History is gross. Science as well, gets a little messy sometimes. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lamel. Or a comma, you pick. That's the best part of these hybrid animals. They have two names, really, so you can choose whatever sounds the most silly. A lamel is the result of crossbreeding in Dubai. Yeah, the crown prince thought, you know what? We've made enough memories here. Let's make an animal. Why not? What could go wrong? Let's make a comma and name it Rama. And he did, he did just that. Rama the comma, just rolls off the tongue. What could go wrong? Researchers in the United Arab Emirates artificially inseminated a camel back in 1998. They were hoping Hoping to have this brand new animal born with the wool of a llama and the temperament of a camel. Instead, they got him, this little guy. Rama is known to be moody, but you know what? To be fair, I would be moody as well if I was just born. If I was just created out of nowhere. Like, why do my knees hurt? They're like, well, those are new knees. We have never seen those knees before. So that's why they're clicking. Number nine, mules and hinnies. So right off the bat here, a mule is already a hybrid. It's the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. And a henny is the offspring of a male horse and a female donkey. Get it? Got it? Great. Mules have been a pretty common asset since George Washington days, fun fact. But it wasn't until 2003 until the University of Idaho cloned one. Yeah, we cloned a hybrid animal. I feel like we're flying too close to the sun here, honestly. The mule's name, well, the clone rather, was Idaho Gem. That's a fair name, he's, he's pretty well a gem, yeah. Number eight, sheep goats. I love these ones, I'm not gonna lie. They're, they're odd, but they're very cute, undeniably cute, these little miracles. It was really this one goat in Northern Germany who did this one. He saw this sheep on the other side of a fence and thought, you know what, forget the last million years of evolution, I'm gonna try something. 
I'm gonna go talk to her. Let's see what happens. She goes to another school. Let's see what's up. I'm gonna be brave. You hopped the fence, went over, got some phone numbers, had some dates, did some dirties. The odd time this does happen, usually nothing happens long term. But when farmer Claus Ekstrenbrink saw this fling, he couldn't believe his eyes later. A sheep goat or a geep was born in front of his eyes, yeah, and they named it Lisa. What a lovely name. How sweet is that? Also, this list starts a little tame and then they get into some, you know, pig human stuff. So if you're saying, aw, right now, no, buckle up, it gets much worse. Starting with number seven, beefalo. Yeah, not necessarily the government, but back in the mid 1700s, thousands of ranchers, I'm talking like 6,000 ranchers, all agreed to raise hybrid beefalo. Yeah, that was the thing they were gonna change in history at that point. They're like, let's do it, and then they went with beefalo. Well, they didn't really have a choice. The beefalo is a result of American bison meeting cattle. These accidental hybrids are normal. They're expected in some way, shape, or form, but cut to the late 1800s, cattle and bison were intentionally created. Yeah, Colonel Samuel Benson, guy was warden of Stony Mountain Penitentiary. He's like, you know what? I'm a crossbreed some animals. Yeah, take my thousands of keys. Thank you. I'm gonna go a animal life it is for me now, I guess. Guy buys eight bisons and then breeds them with Durham cattle. Yeah, what do you do on your weekends when you retire, I guess. The beefalo is a great improvement. Apparently it's a great milker. I, I don't know much about milking beefaloes or buffaloes, but warden Samuel Benson, he was your guy in the late 1800s. He would have chatted your ear off about milk and beefalo. Number six, lions. Back in the 1980s, the Chat Bar Zoo in India started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has less of a shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, this sounds like a good idea, a step forward rather, dare I say. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. Yeah, it's like, hey, we saved ya. Just kidding, you're going to a much worse place. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was a mistake. Things weren't going well at all. His back legs were quite weak. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, obviously this got worse. Their immune systems started to fail more and more. And come 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. They finally decided to stop the program and then all these males were given vasectomies in order to you know, prevent any reproduction down the line. But there were laws that prohibited them from killing these animals. So they were actually just waiting for them to die naturally, which is, Sad. You're like, hey, great law, but yeah, today, come on. When there's a dwindling population of lions, it's you know, it's wild that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when you know they could have simply just bred lions that they had and then focused all their energy on that instead of creating a alien lion. But who am I? I'm just a YouTube host. It's probably harder than it sounds, but man, this stuff is uh, it's pretty rough. Number five, Walfin. Well, there's a word I have never said before in my entire life. These guys were created when a female common bottlenose dolphin was bred with a male killer whale. Yeah, what a riot, what a pair, what a duo. These are extremely rare and they've been found in the wild, but unfortunately, most of the ones that have existed were bred in captivity. Yeah, because humans suck. The first recorded Walfin was born at the Tokyo Sea World in 1981, but he sadly died not even a year after his birth. Just two days in and it was done. Obviously, this is not working out, but the first born Walfin in the United States that miraculously somehow survived was at Sea Life Park in Hawaii, and that was in 1985. And her name was Kekamalu. She ended up having three babies. She did survive. Now, the first baby passed away after a few days, and the second passed away at the age of nine, but nine years old. This is already a massive improvement from what we've seen earlier, and thankfully the third one is still living to this day. Yeah, both Kekamalu and her daughter are still alive, but they still remain in captivity. Number four, farm cow. In the 1990s, farmers in India figured that if they were to crossbreed their cattle, they'd be able to breed cattle that could produce more milk, which would of course mean more money, which is better for everyone and their families. Now this was an ideal step, right? What could possibly go wrong? A lot of things could go wrong here. Different breeds of bulls were brought in and farmers were expecting milky results, you know, good results. And they ended up with cattle that did produce more milk, but at the same time, these guys needed way more food or else they'd stop producing said great amounts of milk. They wouldn't get milky results after that point. Plus they were less resistant to local diseases, so they required way more uh, vet visits. So yeah, they're producing more milk, which will get us more money, but they also cost us more money long-term. So AKA, not a solution. Number three, dog mixing. Oh, this one's sad too. No more fun and games, no more milk and jokes. This one's wild. But this one is also a reminder that you can't just put any type of dog together and then just see what happens. Yeah, that's, that's not gonna fly, my friends. That's not how, DNA works. I got the D, didn't know how to do the N or the A, really. 
Back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy came in and said she just didn't want the dog anymore, wasn't feeling comfortable owning this specific dog. In fact, it didn't look like any dog she had seen in the past, which was odd considering her occupation. The dog had a shorter body, it was like stuffy almost, and its jaw was larger, and had a massive underbite. It didn't look easy to navigate at all, this poor thing. Well, it turns out the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. This is the result of backyard breeding, just, you know, improvising on your own. Don't do that. Yeah, leave it to the people who know what they're doing. Please, for the love of God. Julie ended up taking care of this dog, because she had to, because this person's like, eh, bye. And they had a great relationship, but this is not ideal. Don't do this. Number two, human pig. Yeah, of course we had to save this one for the last two. This is wild. This is some next level stuff. This is a Marvel film? Human pig? What are we doing? Scientists in California back in 2017 were up to some pretty remarkable stuff. An embryo was placed in an adult pig for around four weeks, then once scientists analyzed said embryo afterwards, they learned that the embryos not only, one, survived the process, which is a miracle in itself, but two, the human cells also remained. Uh, okay, now what? This is next level crossbreeding right here. The goal here, scientifically, was to grow human organs inside the pigs. And Juan Carlos Esbezua Belmonte successfully created pig-human hybrids at the Salk Institute lab. Yeah, can't wait till we have a pig superhero now, or pig uh, villain. Those exist too. Number one, Pizzly Bear. Yeah, we gotta finish this list off on an educational note. We always gotta remind the world that the ice everywhere is melting all the time. Yep, we're slowly melting, folks. Better believe it. And Pizzly Bears are here to warn us. Back in 2006, a Canadian hunter found a hybrid bear. They called it a Pizzly Bear or a Growler Bear because it looked like a mix of the two. But it actually was. It was a hybrid. Tests were later done in 2010 after more appeared in Alaska and northern Canada. Now, historically, polar bears branched off of grizzlies DNA-wise, but now we're at a point where they're coming back together. Why? Because everything's melting and food is becoming sparse. So now, they're going further away to find food, and in turn, they're meeting each other. And then they're, you know, doing the, doing the thing. Now they're starting to merge back together. And in turn, we get these terrifying bears. We have some human hybrids, some, some pig stuff, some, some milk talk. This list was loaded. This is a loaded pierogi full of uh, crossbreeding facts. There you go. Just what you wanted to hear, I bet.